So I'm super excited to be here. This is my second time in Ukraine, second time in Kiev. I was here for Java Day last year. You guys have a phenomenal conference, so I was super excited to come back and spend some more time with you. Did anyone see my presentations from last year by show of hands? Oh, relatively few of you, okay. Uh, I'm not covering a lot of the same ground. This is gonna be more of a tips and tricks around Docker, and we're gonna make Docker and Java blow up. And that's gonna be part of the trick here. Uh, those slides are available at bit.ly, Java Docker fail. So that bit.ly link will take you to the slide deck and you should, you'll want to get access to that slide deck because it has all the information you'll need in it. There's a ton of other links in it also. So how many people here have already used Docker? Okay, the majority of you, that's pretty common. How many people have also used Kubernetes? So typically, you know, a pretty dramatic drop off from Docker to Kubernetes. Uh, and there'll be a point in there, if I get all the demos running correctly, you'll see an, uh, an advantage of using Kubernetes, purely because of the fact that when Docker does die, Kubernetes restarts it, okay? So, and that may sound kind of funny, but I have seen people use that as their strategy for dealing with this problem. <laughs> so we'll, we'll show you what that means when we get into it. So we have a bunch of slides to walk through to kind of give you the overview, and then I have a bunch of demonstrations to walk you through. And again, the demonstrations, and as well as the demo script, is linked in the document itself that you see here. All right, so this is the concept of the container, right? We have this little nice little whale there named Moby, and the concept of the container means that we can put things in it. The idea of the shipping container was that it basically standardized all shipping, you know, specifically shipping from port to port around the world. Everything was the same size and shape. Therefore, essentially now we have robotics that move these containers from ship to shore and shore to ship. I don't believe there's a, a big shipping yard nearby here. Uh, but nor when I did this presentation in Barcelona, or when I did this in San Francisco, those are big port cities. And then if you go up into uh, Holland as an example, it's all robotic now. Because everything's a uh, uniform size, they don't need humans to move these things around anymore. It's all robots. Uh, so that's the benefit of having a container. And the same thing applies in this Linux world. So we have the concept of putting cargo in a stack of containers, and we can put Java in a container. And the tra challenge with putting Java in a container, once you constrain it, and you will want to constrain it, meaning you put parameters on it, it tends to blow up. And if, you've not, if you don't know about this, if you're not aware of it, it will blow up on you when you move to production. Typically, it doesn't blow up on your development laptop, but as soon as you move that same image and that exact same runtime to production, that's when you see it die. Okay, so maybe you guys have already experienced that already. I've talked to a lot of people like, oh, that's why it dies. And they didn't actually know why it died. They just kept restarting it. <laughs> and that, that could be a strategy for you. Okay, so the whole goal here is to put Duke, Java, in a container, happy, on the beach. That's what we're going for here. You like my pretty pictures? All right. So the big win for a Linux container, of course, is these concepts. You guys have used Docker already. You should be comfortable with these concepts. It's a highly portable packaging solution, kind of like that shipping solution that we talked about earlier. You can make robots basically manage it, which is kind of like Kubernetes when we get a chance to talk about that. It's a lightweight, encapsulated way to move your operating system around with your JVM, with your application code. This means you can actually create, uh, set up the operating system exactly the way you want it to be, configure the way you want it to be, and then move it around back and forth with the actual JVM, with your actual application. So the getting started experience is super easy. Once you have the Docker daemon installed, whether it be from uh, Docker for Mac, Docker for Windows, however you received it, Minikube, Minishift, et cetera, we'll show you some examples of that, uh, you just do Docker run. And it's like magic, right? You guys have already felt that magic since many of you already used Docker already. But your development environment gets to match your production environment from the perspective of we've configured it the same way. If we use uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux in production, we can make that also run on the laptop and make sure that that container looks the same. That way you don't have the issue of moving from a developer workstation to a production workstation, uh, server, aside from this one issue that we're gonna talk about in this session, right? The fact that if you constrain it and you're not aware of how those constraints work, things don't go so well sometimes. Uh, my favorite one down here at the bottom, if you're typically with a big enterprise working in a large corporation, it takes you a long time to get a computer, okay? Let's say you work for a Red Hat, as an example. It could take you weeks, if not months, to get a computer. Uh, if you work in a big enterprise, I was talking to one organization recently, to get a computer, I'm, I'm talking for IT people, for programmers, six weeks wait time to get a computer. And so that's common. It may not be common in your organization, but it's very common in the Fortune 500, the Global 2000, the big organizations of the world. You wait weeks to get access to a computer. The nice thing about this solution we're talking about now is you can get a computer instantly with that Docker run command as an example. 
Okay? So here's our cargo ship with all the little containers on it. That's kind of what we're going to focus on. And what we want to make sure we do correctly is it doesn't spill over and fall apart. You're going to see a lot of these kind of images to make it fun. The concept of virtualization you guys probably have seen before. You have the hypervisor and you have basically everybody gets their own unique virtual machine. In the case of a container, we're sharing parts of that virtual machine essentially with each container. So that's one reason things, it's, it's a little bit of leaky abstraction, right? It's not perfect. It doesn't fully contain and that's what we'll see here, okay? Uh, that's what you're going to see when we get into this. So there's lots of pros and cons. Again, since you guys have mostly used Docker already, you should be familiar with these things. But keep in mind, it's not a virtual machine. It is not perfect. It doesn't perfectly contain. And that's what we'll, you'll see when we get into the actual demonstration of it. It is not perfectly portable either. You should be aware of the fact that if you put, let's say, uh, an Ubuntu base image in your Docker container and you try to run that on, let's say, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, it probably would work but it's not a supported stack, and if your kernels are slightly out of tune with each other, it won't work. So you really want to be full stack if you can. If you're going to go you know, uh, De Debian, be Debian top to bottom. If you're going to be Red Hat, be De Red Hat top to bottom. Your host and your container OS is really out to match. Okay? Uh, when, that, when we get into the Windows container world, right, Windows Server containers, we'll have to see how that plays out, but so far you know, that's still a little bit in the future, what we're dealing with here. Okay, here's the lineage of containers, right? So it started way back here with the concept of jails, with the concept of SE Linux. These things started back in the early 2000s. So this is where, you know, the kind of history of containers came from. You'll see us rather late in the game where .cloud at a Python conference lightning talk, uh, it was called .cloud at the time, in 2013, they came out with this concept of Docker. All right, and they showed you what Docker could do, Docker run, Docker build, and it was kind of a magical moment because they made Linux containers so much easier to use. Uh, and then, of course, Kubernetes came out a little bit after that. But you can kind of see what the history of this thing is. Okay? And so what we've been working since that point is to help make these things even easier to use and even safer for people to use. That's kind of the focus at Red Hat as well as other organizations who are working on Linux containers. Now, here's the trick. Docker actually was born long before that date. So Java came out well before containers existed, and therefore, it's not really container aware unless you know how to treat it correctly. Okay, so that's where we, we get into a little bit of trouble, and we'll show you what that means. So you've got to be cautious of this picture right here. You don't want it to tump over on you, and it could be very bad. Now, this is the challenge we as Java developers have had for a number of years now. This concept is pretty straightforward, right? I want to basically package up my application in a unique way. Typically, when we used to package our application, it was just a war file or a jar file, and we might have simply told our operations team, our testing team, et cetera, how they should run that application. Maybe we did it through an email, and we'll see that a little bit later. But the concept here is I can now put my entire application stack in this one, essentially, Docker file. I can describe it programmatically in a codified way, not in an email file, okay? And so for those of you who use email for your source control, yeah, I'm telling you, you should stop doing that. Okay, and someone's la you know, somebody you're laughing like, yeah, I know a company that still uses email for source control. You know, I emailed the other developer. That's a version now in the email server. Yeah, people are still doing that. I know. Um, same concept applies here. You can codify the stack now, right, as a Docker file, and you can ship that around. Or in the case of a Kubernetes file, you'll see some of those when we get into it. But everything can be specified here nicely, and that actually was what makes this more portable. You have to be a little cautious of dealing with the development environment, which is probably Windows in your case. Most people develop on Windows these days. They have a version of Java, often a fairly uh, new version of Java, right? Because you know developers tend to put that on their laptop. Uh, they might have a really cool app server like Wildfly. I work for you know JBoss, Red Hat, right? I used to work with Wildfly a lot. They maybe configure their data sources to use MySQL, but their production environment looks very different from that. It's often Red Hat Enterprise Linux is production Linux in many cases. They probably have an older version of the JVM because that's what the production people want. They have an older, let's say, WebSphere, WebLogic, or maybe even JBoss for that matter. And it's not the same as on the development side. So that's why this thing is a win, right? You can codify all this in your stacks, move that image across the wire, in theory, over to the production environment. And that's the idea of the shipping container and the analogy that we use throughout this environment, right? You basically have a standardized package. You can pick up and move from place to place with your nice little boat. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Most people don't understand that, a, that the Docker tool, specifically as a tool, a developer experience on top of something called C groups and namespaces. 
So this is, some, this is really what it's doing. It's manipulating C groups at the end of the day, manipulating namespaces. So what's neat about that is you can kind of come in here and inspect some of these things. Specifically, you'll see that it uh, interacts with CPU and CPU set and memory as a perfect example. We'll show you some of those in detail. Um, but that's what it's doing. It's manipulating those guys underneath the covers. So as long as you're aware of that and you know where to look, then you can figure out what's wrong when something goes sideways on you, OK? Now, this specific one is under SF or sys uh, FS C group memory, and you'll see that one in the mem middle there called memory limit and bytes. That's, one, that's probably the most important thing to take away from this entire talk, is knowing where that is and what's in it. If you know what's, what's in there, you'll be vastly better off. Because the unfortunate thing is, by default, the Java virtual machine ignores what's in that field, because it was made before all this container stuff got popular. And so, but, but here's the trick with this. This is a kernel level uh, parameter. If you set it, and you often will, it will kill the JVM without the JVM being any the wiser, because you'll go beyond the limit. Okay, and that's what C groups is there for. Control groups is specifically to constrain processes to a certain set of memory, a certain set of CPUs, a certain set of file system, and that's what it's going to do. And if you try to go beyond your limits, it will let you in some cases, right? But in most cases, it'll just shut you down hard. Specifically with memory, it shuts you down hard. Okay, now, here's your little container. You don't necessarily want to rock it in that kind of ship. This is actually Somali pirates that apparently stole this shipping container. Uh, so that, you don't want that kind of environment for your container, OK? So what do you do? You rock this thing along in something like Kubernetes. And if you think of it from a DevOps standpoint, if you think of it from running at a scale standpoint, it's super easy for you to say Docker run, Docker run, Docker run, Docker run. And if it dies, you come back around, say Docker run, Docker run, Docker run, Docker run. Or you can manage it at scale with something like Kubernetes, where it takes care of those Docker runs for you. You just don't worry about it. You simply say, I want two of these running in the cluster, and it ensures that two are always running. OK? So that's really where you might look something like this, right? Chain these boats together. I'm kidding. We don't want that. So that's where Kubernetes comes in. So the idea here behind Kubernetes, it's the helmsman. It's the ship's pilot. It's the one that's going to manage that big old container ship for you and basically make sure that it doesn't fall over uh, and it do its best to keep your containers live and running and happy. OK? This is kind of an architectural pattern for it. Specifically here, you can kind of see there's a registry. Uh, and then you can see, specifically, there's certain nodes. Think of those as worker nodes or nodes that run your compute infrastructure. So that's where your pods will run. Specifically, all your Docker containers will run on those nodes. And then you can kind of see here, if a node dies, it'll, load, it'll basically restart those guys on a different node. Okay? So it takes care of that for you. You don't have to do Docker run, Docker run, Docker run. And so in some cases, if you suffer from the problem we're going to talk about in this session, which means your container might die because it overextends its memory, if you use Kubernetes, at least it'll start it for you automatically again. Does that sound cool? That sounds like a win. I don't have to think about the problem. I'll just use Kubernetes, and the problem kind of goes away. Well, you really ought to know why you're dying to begin with, OK, and protect yourself from that. So why does it fail? If you look at a developer workstation, you might have 8 gigs of RAM, 4 cores of CPU on that on machine. And the Java virtual machine sees all of that by default. Okay? It sees you have eight gigs, and it sees you have four cores, and it tries to allocate what it can of that. It assumes it owns the machine. That's how it works by default. Okay? It actually uses a quarter of the memory available to it, and in this case, it'll use two gigs on this side. Here's the problem. When you take that exact same image and you move it over there to the big server, which has a lot more memory, a lot more CPUs, it goes, oh, I have this machine now. Let me try to grab all its memory and all its CPUs. And that's where things get sideways on you, OK? So it's specifically this piece of code right here. If you actually go into system dial, uh, sorry, uh, runtime .get runtime max memory, or you go runtime.runtime get available processors, you will see that it over-reports the amount of memory and CPUs you have. And so it's just kind of right there in the API. So you'll see it right there. So it's, this is kind of the trick to the whole presentation. If you can solve this problem or not trust this data, you'll be fine. OK? But you know, this is what your shipping container might look like if you're not careful. And here's the problem. Who uses those APIs? I suspect for most of you, you don't actually have used those APIs in your average application. But all your middleware teams often use those APIs. Your Tomcat will use those APIs, right? Your Wildfly. Uh, the Vertex team who is here, Clement might be here, he's like, OK, we just fixed this in Vertex <laughs> so we don't use that API any longer. 
But these guys use those same APIs to determine how many available CPUs there are, and often they'll spin up the appropriate thread pools based on that count. Okay? So that's where it gets you in a little trouble. And so most of these are just CPU related, they're not memory related. Uh, so that at least makes it a little bit safer, because over allocating threads isn't dangerous per se, it just means you're over allocating resources you can't use. Uh, but in the case of over allocating memory, you will get shut down hard. Okay? So the JVM ergonomics, there's the URL at the top of this uh, slide here, talk about how these things are determined. So the, this is how the Java virtual machine determines how much memory it should allocate, how many threads it should allocate, et cetera, et cetera. You should just be aware of what it is. You can see maximum heap size by default is a quarter of physical memory. So that's going to basically say, let me grab a quarter of available memory, and that's what it's doing right there, okay? It's just a quarter of available memory. Um, and just be, you just have to be mindful of that. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about memory. You guys are probably familiar with XMX or XMS, right? Setting those specific heap sizes. One thing you should be aware of is heap is approximately 50% of total memory used. This is often confusing for people. They're like, oh, I, I set my heap size properly. Often they, over, they make the heap size too big. Your heap size needs to be about half your container memory now. Okay, so just keep that in mind. If your container is set to, let's say, 200 megabytes, you should make your XMX about 100 megabytes, just to be on the safe side. 50% is about the magic number. It's not a perfect calculation, it's just about right. And that's based on the recommendations we've had from multiple uh, JDK people. Because there's all this other stuff that's happening inside the JVM. So you should just be aware of that, that all these other things are happening also. You can also set a new parameter that's been added called max RAM, and that'll set the whole JVM memory to that specification, so 500 meg in this case, and therefore about half that, 250 meg, would be available for heap. Okay, and heap's the only one you're really gonna interact with because that's where your Java objects are gonna go. Okay, again, if you don't do this well, it might look like this, a burning fire on a container ship. So there's a workaround specifically to this. Depending on what version of the JDK you're on, you can use our Fabric 8 base image, and I know this is a little hard to see, but watch what it's doing. It's simply calculating Right from that parameter we told you earlier. It's going to C groups and going, hey, how much memory should I really have? And based on that calculation, based on that cat command, it then sets XMX accordingly, half, about half that. So it's a simple, simple workaround to solve this problem, but if you're not aware of it, it could bite you when you don't necessarily, it basically will bite you when you're pushing it to production. Sound cool so far? Okay. This issue was patched in Java 8U131 and also in Java 9. So if you're on 131, this was patched, but there's a trick to it. It's not on by default. You gotta ask for this feature, okay? And we'll show you what that is. So you can kinda see right here, uh, and actually we can try this, let's just try this ourselves here. So you can kinda see there's this Docker run, 100 megabytes, and let's just do this real quick. I'll just copy and paste it right here from the slide, how about that? So let's do, do a Docker run here. You can kind of see, so I said Docker run, constrain it to 100 megs of RAM, run the, you know, 121 version of that, and basically, hey, uh, Java, how much memory do you think you have? And it says, oh, I can run 241 megs of RAM for heap. So already, you can kind of see it just calculated it wrong by default. Um, and the way it got that 241, it's a quarter, approximately a quarter, of the actual virtual machine memory, which is one gigabyte in this case. So I'm running against this virtual machine right now. It has one gigabyte and two cores assigned to it, assigned to it, and therefore uh, the JVM is going, oh, I can have a quarter of that. That's what it does by default. Um, making, let's make this point a little bit more crisp. Let's do this. Uh, CPUs equal one uh, open JDK, and actually just use a different version of JDK just to kind of make it a little bit more interesting. Dun, 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 dun. And yeah, oh. let me do this up here. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, so Java version. Okay, see it's 131, Java C version. Okay, let me add a little, I'm just gonna add a little class to it. I have it up here in this readme for the demo. And again, the demo is linked in the slide deck. Let's do this, all right, so we have this new test file, see test.java there, let's compile it, uh, test.java. All right, and then we'll just show you what the code looks like real quick. All right, it's very straightforward, it's just those two, you know, two APIs we mentioned earlier, how much memory do you think you have, how many processors do you think you have? And if I say Java, test, 
Okay? It thinks it has 240 megs of RAM available to it, even though it technically only has 100. Uh, to prove that point, let's go here, here, C group, and let's go to memory, and cat memory limit in bytes. Okay? One meg. Those are in bytes. Divide by 1024, but divide by 1024. Or sorry, 100 meg. So this is where you get into a little trouble, because you will get shut down hard. Okay, by default, Docker, which is using C groups underneath the covers, this is a C groups thing, right? It's literally a Linux kernel thing. It will shut you down. Uh, to kind of maybe make that point a little bit more crisply, let's try this. Let's see if I have this one on here. Uh, maybe it was this window. Yeah. So here's a good example. We're going to run the image called JBoss Wildfly, uh, bring it up on 8080, but in this case, we're going to give it a 50 megabyte limit. Okay, 50 megabytes. Uh, but if you watch closely, Oh, Docker, RM, my wildfly. Let's kill the previous one. Okay. Watch what happens here. Notice the XMX is set to 512. So in this case, it's manually set by the wildfly application server, but the container said, sorry, you only get 100 megabytes of RAM to work within. And so we're, it's trying to start. In this case, the JVM is running the, the wildfly application server. Um, but, you know, let me see. And it seems to be stuck at this point. Let's go check it out. <laughs> uh, Docker PS. All right. Nope. Oh, it's dead. So it came up quickly and then it went away. So right there, you can see it said received the kill signal. It didn't even come up. It didn't even load in this case because of that 50 megabytes. So if I say Docker PS A, uh, grep. Uh, actually, I can do it this way Docker inspect uh, my wildfly. Okay, and we go up here, you can see where to go, where to go, where to go, where to go. Out of memory killed, true. So as long as you're just aware of what's going on, you'll, and some of you are probably thinking, oh, this is why it dies in production. I've had that conversation with multiple people after this session, like, oh, we just let it, it just died and we just restarted it. We didn't know why it died. <laughs> So it's just a simple thing, and you just have to know how to work around it, okay? So just keep that in mind. So if you deal in a Docker, Dockerized world, and you have the memory constraint, and you have the CPU constraint, the JVM by default will over, overload that. Uh, let's go here. So let's try this one. Uh, there, okay. And you can see in this case, we give it the 100 megabyte limit again. We used 131 again, but we have unlocked experimental options. Use C groups memory for heap. And now it says 48 instead of 200. Okay. It's about 50% of the 100 we gave it. So real simple, as long as you know about this experimental options and the memory for heap, uh, limit, uh, C groups memory limit for heap. Okay, and it's just looking at that same file uh, that I showed you earlier, the memory uh, limited bytes. You guys are thinking, wow, I gotta sit here for 50 minutes and that's the whole trick? Yeah, that's the whole trick, but we got more to show you. Okay? All right, so just keep in mind, there's the file. You can go look at it. So you can exec into Docker exec, Docker SSH, um, uh, QCTL exec into your, into your container and then go look what it's set there. I do that all the time now because I'm like, what did, what did that get set to? just to see if, in fact, it's, sit, it's con uh, configured to work within my, the, con the concept of my JVM. Is the JVM going to respect it? Now, cores also is problematic, right? It tends to over-allocate cores. By def default, the JVM not only sees all memory on the host, it also sees all cores on the host. And if you have a big old 64 gigabyte machine with you know, 24 cores, it's going to see all that. And in this case, it doesn't blow up, right? It can't, the, the C groups won't let it access to those cores, but, it doesn't blow up because what happens is you just don't have access to the CPUs. It's like you work, the JVM doesn't necessarily deal with the fact, or it, does, it kind of ignores the fact that the CPUs are unavailable to it. But you will over allocate threads, right? So if you were using these numbers to actually calculate your thread pool, many people do, then your thread pool will be, let's say, 200 threads and you have a single core. Well, that's not going to work out. Okay, <laughs> you have a lot of contention over that single core. So just keep that in mind. Now, notice here that the second option there, with the little asterisk, okay, this one right here. That's specifically the one Kubernetes is going to use. You should just be aware of that. So the, see where it says uh, CPU quota, which is 1, 000, uh, 150,000 over a CPU period, which is 100,000. That basically says, give me 1.5 cores. 
Okay, so 1.5 cores approximately. That's what that calculates out to. The 100,000 in this case, from a Kubernetes standpoint, is always 100,000. So take whatever number you give it, divide it by 100,000. And then that's approximately how many cores you have access to within that time window. There's another option for Docker, which is Docker run and CPU set. So you can see where it says CPU set uh, zero and two there. Let's actually try that real quick. Uh, I'll just grab it out of the slide again. And let's see here. But let's go ahead and make it CPU set zero. And we'll give it 400 meg in this case. Let me grab that little piece of test code again. Uh, oh, wait. Have to have IT so I can get into it. There we go. There we go. Java C. Test. Java. Hmm. OK. See there? CPU is equals one this time instead of two. So it, is, so it is clever. That was fixed in a recent release of the JVM to basically say, oh, if you use CPU sets, we know, you know, if, if you go back up here, CPU set was one core, obviously, specifically zero. It's pins to zero. It starts at zero. So if there's four cores, zero, one, two, and three, it's pinned to zero now. That works from a JVM standpoint. It calculates correctly that you only have a single core to work with. The downside to this, if anyone can imagine, is in a clustered environment. So in other words, if I take all my containers now and throw them into a cluster of four different machines and they're all trying to grab CPU zero, it's not going to work. Okay? <laughs> so the, it's nice that this has been corrected, but it's kind of meaningless to anyone who runs more than one Docker instance, right? And basically, if you're running in a clustered architecture, it's not going to work out for you. So just keep that in mind. Uh, and Kubernetes is specifically using this option instead. All right, we'll keep going here. Now, you can see that when we, we do the mapping here, uh, if like, for instance, here I say I want CPUs two, I want two cores available to this container, there's some recommendations we have. For instance, you can do things like concurrent GC threads two and parallel GC threads. It doesn't make sense to start a ton of threads for when you don't have the CPUs. Right? A thread has to execute on a CPU, it has to execute on a core. Therefore, it makes more sense if you're going to constrain the CPU count, and you will in a clustered architecture, that's what you're going to do. You're going to say, okay, you get, two, you get two cores and so much memory, you get four cores and so much memory, you get half a core and so much memory. That's what you're going to do with your containers as you move them from place to place. You'll want to kind of configure the JVM accordingly. And you can kind of see down here where we basically have half a CPU, half a core dedicated to this container. Okay? That's where we said use the serial GC. Don't use the parallel GC. You don't necessarily want all those extra threads that you can't take advantage of because you don't have access to the CPUs and cores in that case. So just keep that in mind. So the CPU set that we showed you earlier, it was patched in this release. Here's a screenshot of that and the, and the link specifically to the bug. You can go check it out. That's where CPU set was uh, done. There's also, uh, well, let's just walk you through a bunch of demos, more demos of this, can kind of see it in action. All right, so here I am, Docker images. Let's go over here now. Let's going to show you a little, a little application. So let's say here's my little Spring Boot application. OK? It's a very straightforward Spring Boot application. Uh, I can do Maven clean compile package, right? Let's just double check that everything is compiled and I haven't typed anything errantly while we're sitting here talking. So it should compile. There we go. It's going to give me a, uh, a fat jar. OK, my little Spring Boot application is going to give me a little fat jar right there. And of course, if you run it, java-jar, target, target, uh, boot, boom. Let's run that. And it should run on 8080. Let it load up. OK. And uh, let's go over here. Uh, let's go over here. Localhost 8080. And it has a certain URL, API hello. Let's make that bigger. OK, see what it says? It's got access to uh, 300. Oh, sorry, uh, three gigs of memory and eight cores. Okay, and if you look at the, the code here, because I ran this straight on the, this workstation, which has 16 gigs of RAM and eight cores, you can kind of see it basically is using those same uh, APIs to basically how much memory do I have and how many cores do I have. So that's all it's doing, right? That's the hello method. It's basically grabbing uh, memory, grabbing available processors, and displaying that. Hello X Spring Boot, hello X Spring Boot. So you can kind of see right away where you can get in a little bit of trouble here. OK, uh, let's shut that down. Dun, dun, dun. OK, and let's put it actually in this little Docker container. So that's the simple Java code associated with that. Here's the Docker file. You can see it says from OpenJDK 8. Make it a little bit bigger. 
okay? And then I'm gonna basically take that fat jar, I'm gonna move it into the, uh, you know, move it into the working directory there, I'm gonna export, expose 8080, and then I'm gonna say Java, and we're gonna print out a bunch of flags here, okay, in Java options, but all it's gonna do is a java-jar in the name of the jar file. That's basically how, it's the same thing you just saw on localhost, but in this case, inside my Docker container. Make it super simple. Uh, so I already have one of these built, but let's, let's go, well, Docker images. There we go. I already have one of these built, but let's go and rebuild it, because uh, I did do the, the X there. So Docker build, dash T, burr, I did the burr X boot, boom, and then dot. Okay, so this is gonna build our Docker image. Uh, not valid reference format. What? Equals. Equals? I mistyped. Oh, there's an equal sign. Okay, I, you guys just, <laughs> I couldn't figure out what, where the equals came from. All right, I see it now. Keep in mind, I'm half blind at this point. My glasses are over here, but the microphone gets in the way. Okay, uh, so there it is, Docker images. All right, so that's, there's a guy just built, oh, and actually it's latest, I forgot to say V1, let's make that even better, uh, V1. Okay, so that's just a tag, and then if we do a Docker run on it, dash uh, IT, make the memory constraint uh, equal 100, uh, we'll just make the CPU constraint also, CPUs one, and then we're going to basically say burr x boot boom V1. And we need to get the ports. Oh, there, I always forget the ports. Uh, 8080, colon, uh, 8080. Let's see if I got that right this time. All right, so there it goes, and the, all this information is basically because we use those extra parameters there, which is print flags final, print GC details, because that way you can go in there and see exactly what the JVM thinks it has at a, at a very great level of detail. And, and let's double check here. I have the IP address already figured out, so let's go here. Okay, and so you can see now, we just switched to the, this is the Docker image running, or the Docker container running. It thinks it has 240 megs of RAM, and that 240, again, comes because it's running in a virtual machine with one gig. So it's not the, you know, this amount over here with eight cores, and three plus gig, it's, a, you know, it's 240 meg and two cores. And it's all based on this virtual machine you see right here, right? You can see it says two processors, one gig of RAM. And so that's already means it's kind of confused about that. Now let's kind of watch this, all right? If you look at the other method in this little application, all it's gonna do if you actually ask for memory, it's simply gonna use those parameters, max memory, okay? And it's gonna simply concatenate a string until it gets up to max memory. So this is why max memory being wrong is kind of a concern. So if I come over here now, we got that guy running. Look, it's Docker stats. And let's see here, okay. You can see it's kind of running up at 92% of available memory. And what was the IP address? Uh, Docker machine IP, Docker one, two, 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 dun, dun, dun. Okay, there it is. So if I say curl. Uh, API hello, let's just double check that. All right, so that's the, what we were just seeing in the browser. Uh, so two cores, 240. But if I hit the other one, okay, hit the memory, you'll kind of see what it's done, and it's dead and gone. So we just killed it, okay? And it does say killed over here. So what was running is no longer running. It's now gone. And so it's easy to kind of make this simple mistake. You know, you basically just are interacting with a heap a set of objects that you think are available to you, and they're not available to you. And so just keep that in mind. Um, here, we can run it again. Okay, again, one CPU, 100 megs of RAM. Go and run that again. I'll bring this, you can see Docker stats again, shows how much memory is in use. And just getting the Spring Boot application loaded pretty much uses 100 megabytes of RAM all by itself before we allocate any objects inside the JVM. So we're pretty close to the limit already, and then we hit it and it's gonna completely go beyond the limit, C groups kills it. Now, this is kind of fun and cool, um, but for the fact that, let's try this, kubectl get pods. If you're running in a, in a Kubernetes world, so watch this guy, so this is the exact same application running in a Kubernetes world, uh, to kind of see how that works. We already did the build of the image, 
Let's do this. Okay, just gonna so you can see what that looks like when it runs. Okay, so it's this is doing just doing a Maven based build. It's doing a Docker build there also. See Docker build dash t like before. No equal sign this time. <laughs> okay, um, in this case, my lower window here is interacting with a Kubernetes cluster that I also have running on this machine. The Kubernetes cluster is specifically this guy right here. It has six gigs of RAM and two cores available to it. Okay, uh, so if I interact with this guy, yeah, so uh, let's do this. Uh, dun, dun, dun. And actually, let's do this real quick. I, I script all this out so you can kind of see the complicated syntax. So this is, in fact, the, um, the pod that we just started up there, okay? And so if I come in here and go to sys, fs, uh, I can go to C group, and then memory, and then cat, memory, uh, limit and bytes. There we go, okay? You can kind of see there's the 400 meg that we asked for. How did we ask for that 400 meg? If I go back over here to the Kubernetes file associated with this, so here it is. You can kind of see we basically said you get a limit of 400 megs and you get access to a whole core. So by default, from a Kubernetes standpoint, these are the limits that are just going to be used. It again is using that Docker CPU quota, CPU period, so it's quota over period. Uh, there's also this request one. The request one is not a hard limit. This is for the Kubernetes scheduler to figure out exactly how to distribute it around a cluster. So it looks at the request items to basically say, oh, there's available resources on this node or this node or this node and schedules accordingly. But then, you know, you do have the hard limit of where it will shut you down and not let you go over it, okay? And that's basically what's happening here. So that's the 400 meg that we have here. And so if I get back out of here, okay, and let's do this. I also have a little script that basically grabs those details. Uh, and, okay. And you kind of see basically it does it execs into the specific Java demo, looks at that specific pod, it grabs the 400 there. You can also see what it's doing from a CPU count here also, okay? And uh, notice the CPU shares here is set for 256, while a default Docker is set to uh, 1024. And, okay. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Da, 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 da. Let me bring up another window here. Uh, let's see here. Cube CTL get pods. Let me see if I have those running. Okay. Da, da, da. All right, so there it is. Oop. So watch those guys right there. Come back over here. And let me see. Oh, we have the nine. Well, give me the IP address for this. So in this case, it's giving the IP address to that virtual machine, and it's giving the node port. In this case, it's hitting hello again, so we can just come over here and hit this. Uh, curl here, API, hello. Okay, so you can see this is what we were looking at earlier. Uh, and why is it hanging up there? Did I, oh, I missed, the, I missed the one there, didn't I? You guys are got to keep me honest here. All right, there we go. So you can see it's basically, it thinks it has access to, you know, over a gig and two cores by default. Um, again, the JVM is over-reporting what the memory is. And then we can basically say memory. So we'll hit that same errant endpoint as we saw earlier. Uh, but watch what happens up here. Okay, so you can see that we have two pods running. Uh, one and one means it's ready. Uh, and it got an empty reply because it actually died. But the nice thing about Kubernetes, even though it died, it'll restart it for us. So let's see if we can watch it restart. Uh, you can see it's got six restarts already. Uh, come on, come on, come on, there we go. Oh, I think I wasn't scrolling correctly. So you can see where it says out of memory killed, and then it brought it back up again, restart seven. So even though it got shut down because it violated its memory constraint, Kubernetes is like, okay, we'll restart it. And I've actually had some people tell me, well, I have some really bad programmers who work at my company, so this is our answer. Seriously, they were serious about that. <laughs> if the programmers can't write the code correctly, they were, it does some bad things like this, including just bad programming logic so that it actually dumps the JVM, right? It actually causes the JVM to shut down. Well, Kubernetes will really start it. It's kind of straightforward from that perspective. So that might be your workaround. If you just use Kubernetes, it'll restart. But you should at least know why it's getting killed in the first place, OK? Let's see here. How much more time do we have? About 10 minutes. The, let me look at the console. I want to see what that looks like from a user interface standpoint. So we have, this is OpenShift console here. And let me see here. So OpenShift is Red Hat's, you know, 
Kubernetes environment. So there it is. So that's the guy that was just getting killed there. Actually, I'm curious to see what the event page says. Let's see what it says. Container created, started, pulled, unhealthy. Okay. Uh, so it was trying to monitor that guy specifically and, um, and watch it go down. So we can hit it again. And let's see here. Da, da, da. So it's trying to hit it again. And then killed. And you'll see it restart. So zero of one ready. And when it's one of one ready, then you know you have the container ready. Uh, so it's just basically restarting that Linux container that you saw earlier. Uh, crash will backed off, running. And then still zero of one. We'll see it go ready. One of one is all we're looking for. But you can see it's uh, um, eight restarts. There we go. So now it's back up and running. I do note that the lifecycle of a container or pod inside Kubernetes is using the liveness probe and readiness probe. Uh, so it is using those. You can see that here. Okay. The readiness probe is specifically going to API health in this case. It's waiting for a 200 response. It will delay about 10 seconds. That's why we were waiting a little while before it actually tries to hit that endpoint. And then it'll hit it every three seconds. And that basically sells Kubernetes, oh, it is happy. So that's how it noticed that the thing got killed. Okay, by default, C groups, Linux kernel killed it, not Kubernetes, not even Docker. The Linux kernel killed it, and Kubernetes saying, hey, you okay? You okay? Oh, you're not okay. That's what it was doing, and it's like, let me restart you. Okay, so th that's why the magic is important to understand, important to know. Now, I, the same thing applies to like a vertex based application. It's anything in a JVM, this, these rules apply to. All right, so just keep those things in mind. Uh, and so this demo has an example, a series of examples that we put together, specifically kind of walk you through a Spring Boot example or a uh, Vertex example, because I've had people tell me, why use Spring Boot? It doesn't work that way. Yeah, it does. It's a Linux kernel thing. It has nothing to do with Spring Boot or whatever framework you're running. It's a Linux thing, OK? So just keep that in mind that we have both these examples. And let's see here. We'll get back into the, make sure we cover all the appropriate slides. Uh, doo -doo, not that one. There, where we go? This one. I can't remember what window I'm in. This one. Here we go. All right. And also, I have a whole long demo script also available on, a, on another GitHub, or sorry, Git uh, Google Doc, that you can kind of see all the different steps I went through as we were researching this problem also. Uh, I have another document where I all tested all kinds of different JVMs. And actually, that's a good point. Um, Let's do this real quick. Dun, dun, dun. Where did my other little window go? Dun, dun, this one. Like, you know, some people are like, well, maybe I've had people tell me, no, it's fixed in Docker 9. Well, let's find out. Uh, uh, dash IT, Docker run dash IT. And then, so open, well, I can't remember the image name. Let's do that. Docker images. Already downloaded the image just right before we got here. So it's OpenJDK 9. OK, so Docker run dash dash IT. Uh, open, open JDK. Nine, look at that, it's equal sign again. Uh, and bin bash, let's see if I did that correctly. Oh. One too many dashes. Okay, so Java dash version, uh, Java C dash version, you see this is Java 9 now. Uh, if we run that same little test as before, where'd the read little readme file go here? All right, just that little bit of code there. I gotta copy correctly, and come on. Bump, bump, bump. All right, bump, bump. Go, sorry. There we go. Yeah, Java C. And Java. Okay, again, it's, well, I didn't actually put the memory constraint on it, didn't you guys didn't keep me honest there. I forgot that on the command line. Dash M. Okay. All right, so you can see there, again, it says 241. You've got to use those experimental options as you saw earlier, right? So those flags do matter. Now, they, are the, they hope to make those more lot experimental and default. I've talked to the people on the JDK team, uh, and also we've been discussing exactly how to get the core count right, because <laughs> it's not right either, so how to get that right. But that's still kind of a problem right now. So there's some tips for you in general. As long as you're just aware of the problem, you're going to be good to go, OK? If you make your from command in your Docker file, though, specifically this Fabric 8 one, you will find that we basically have a, that cool little script in there that basically looks at the C groups constraints and applies the appropriate XMX for you, All right? We basically apply the appropriate parameters to the JVM so it doesn't over-allocate memory and doesn't blow up. 
okay? So that's a key one to understand. Um, so this, there's also the Maven Fabricate plugin. So if you're a Maven user and you have a Palm XML, you just run the setup and it'll actually install itself into your Palm XML and then you just do Fabricate Deploy if you're targeting a Kubernetes or OpenShift backbone. And, it'll, and it also works for Docker as well, just straight Docker containers, but I always deploy either to Kubernetes or OpenShift. In that case, it's also cleverly applying the appropriate base image with the script in it that makes you make sure you don't over allocate memory. So just keep that in mind, that that's what's available to you here. There's a ton of resources for you to explore in these categories, so you can kind of see exactly, you know, uh, we have some blogs we've written on how to use Java inside of Docker and how to use the OpenJDK and recommendations around containers. Uh, you can get the GitHub link for this uh, set of demos I was showing you. The link to this overall presentation is right here. Uh, what else? You can kind of see Kubernetes documentation on how resource limits are applied. And so you can read the docs on that. Uh, so there's both Docker docs as well as GitHub, uh, sorry, uh, Kubernetes docs for that. Uh, and then do check out like this container limits link here, because you will see again that, you know, we are doing the math inside that script to basically ensure that you don't over allocate CPU and you don't over allocate memory right there. Okay? So that's where the magic ha happens. As long as you're aware of the problem, you'll be vastly safer and best, uh, vastly better off. And that is it for the presentation. All right, we have a couple minutes. Thank you so much. We have a couple minutes if you have any questions or thoughts or random food to throw at me or anything of that nature. Any, yes sir. Is there, I, limits, is there a reason to, I didn't quite hear the question. Uh, is there a reason to set uh, memory uh, request and memory limit for Kubernetes deployment file to a different values? Oh, yes. Um, so if you look here, yes. Uh, so that's a good question. If you come over here to these deployments, okay, it very well could be that based on the available resources you have in your cluster, you need to constrain this further. Like literally, I'm working on a cluster right now that provides a quota of one gigabyte of RAM. Uh, so that's just another cluster we have within Red Hat. And so you can apply the quotas at the cluster level, meaning you, the developer, only have access to one gigabyte of RAM. Therefore, I'm constantly going into these files and tweaking it down as low as I can get it so I can run two or three or four things simultaneously. And actually, the uh, machine I have running over here, uh, it's already running out of memory. So this one, this guy right here is running a ton of stuff, okay? Including like all these JVMs. Uh, and it's already really struggling. So I'm constantly using those uh, parameters to try to sh shrink it down. Yes, but uh, as I know, if you set a memory request higher than, uh, lower than memory limit, uh, there is a chance that your VM will be uh, evicted if uh, someone else requests this memory uh, how to say it. Well, in, in the case of the hard constraint, which is the second option right here, specifically the, this limit, okay, you, that is a C group space limit. You will be limited to that amount of memory. You also have access to the swap associated with that. So let's say there's also 400 megs of swap, then it will continue running. Uh, but the good news is if you do have a limit, which you should have a limit in any clustered architecture, then um, the JVM won't over allocate. Right? It knows to stay within its memory limit if you tell it what it is. But it will use uh, uh, limit memory limit, yes? Not a request memory limit, yeah? Right. Well, the request and is for scheduling, and yeah, this is the real limit. Uh, the problem here is that your bot can be scheduled to a node that has only 300 megabytes memory, and it will try to locate full 400 megabytes mm -hmm. memory, and it will be evicted. Well, no. Uh, well, it will be evicted from the node. Right. If there's not enough memory on the node anymore, based on this max, it will move that pod to a different node. And it, if from what I know, it can uh, cascade the failure being uh, allocated to other node. It can cause eviction for, for other services that, are, that have similar configuration, and it can cascade... So, so I think what you're saying is you'd rather these numbers be the same, yeah. request and limit. Actually, and I think that's fair. Uh, I've certainly done it that way in previous environments that I've been in. Um, but, you know, just know that one's really for scheduling and one's specifically the hard limit. Yep. It really depends on how many, cons what your constraints are on those nodes. You know, so here's the crazy thing, right? A lot of this Linux container stuff you think is magical and we don't have to think about the hardware, but you do. <laughs> you, you still have actual real limits to those machines. In this case, memory and CPU. Okay, thank you so much. 
And I think we now are officially out of time. So if you have other questions, I'll be available. And otherwise, we'll be getting ready for the next session where we show you a bunch of cool Kubernetes tricks. All right, thank you so much.